Episode number seven with Atlanta Hawks CEO and marketing whiz, Steve Coonan. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Steve Kudin. Steve has been the CEO of the Atlanta Hawks since 2014. After just his first year with the team, the Hawks led the league in annual attendance gains and set single season franchise records for retail sales, sellouts, and season ticket memberships. Prior to joining the Hawks, Steve was the president of Turner Entertainment Networks, where he oversaw the programming, marketing, and strategy for TBS, TNT, and several other prominent networks. Prior to Turner, he was at Coca-Cola, where he served in several capacities, most recently as the vice president of sports and entertainment marketing. Uh, Steve, my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Thank you, Glenn. It's great being here. Let's start with Coke. You were there for 14 years. Coke was, and perhaps still is, one of the biggest marketing machines in the world. Looking back, what would you say was the most valuable marketing insight that you got there? I, I learned so much at Coke. It, it was like getting, you know, your doctorate in marketing. I joined Coca-Cola in 1986, which right was on the heels of New Coke. So the company um, had just experienced both a, a terrible brand blunder by taking away Coca-Cola and a incredible brand resurgence by making people realize how much they missed the product. And one of the big triggers in the 80s and 90s was the change in the geopolitical landscape, meaning Coca-Cola added 3 billion mouths and consumers with China, Eastern Europe, and Russia coming online. So it's a time of incredible growth. And what we thought about Coca-Cola was Coca-Cola was an idea. And what I learned was if you're selling a product for more per gallon than gasoline, that's basically th sugar, caramel, water, you better infuse magic. And I think the great marketing lesson we learned was how people expect magic from Coca-Cola, especially in their advertising. So we created the Coca-Cola Polar Bears, which stood for Big Bold and Ice Cold. And there were so many opportunities on a global scale to bring just moments of pleasure, introduce new brands, um, and create a literally global distribution network that still is second to none. So was there any particular marketing campaign that you orchestrated that you're most proud of? Well, I think the Always Coca-Cola campaign. Um, Pepsi was really taking it to Coke. And in 1991, Don Keogh, who was president, Herbert Allen on the board, Roberto Gosueto, who was chairman, um, made a very bold decision to move our advertising from Madison Avenue with McCann Erickson, where it had been for 50 years, to Creative Argent artist agency, a talent agency run by a guy named Michael Ovitz, who later went on to become president of Disney. And I was um, responsible for the relationship and for the advertising. Um, and instead of a staff of 500, there were three of us. And we created a strategy of matching the message to the medium. So we created animated spots that ran in The Simpsons. We created unique targeting, but at the center of that was this incredible jingle, Always Coca-Cola, which became very memorable, and the polar bears. And Coke went um, and became the number one advertiser in the world. And we won all kinds of awards. More importantly, the volume grew exponentially. So moving on to Turner, you built a couple behemoth network brands in TNT and TBS when there was very little brand equity when you first joined. Of course, you created billions of dollars of value in the process. What exactly did you do? What did you identify, and how did you turn them around? Well, the problem is, if you hear the title History Channel, Comedy Central, you kind of know what they stand for. And the Turner Networks were named for the creator of the network. And so it was really alphabet soup. It didn't mean much. 
if I'm watching the Food Network, or more importantly, if I'm an advertiser and I understand that and I have a food product, the Food Network might be a very good place to put my advertising. And there was considerable confusion in the marketplace, the difference between TBS and TNT. And truthfully, Turner had tried for years to differentiate them and distinguish them as brands, but they weren't able or willing to make the sacrifice. Because if you're a brand, there are things you do, but there's also just as many and maybe more things you don't do. And I was a very odd hire, in my opinion, because I had no TV experience whatsoever. I was a brand person in a world that was not brand friendly. Um, but... Steve Heyer and Terry McGurk had a very clear vision that in a 500 channel universe, if we don't position ourselves, we're going to perish. And so we made TNT the first and only network dedicated to drama. And we evidenced it in everything that we did. We created the campaign, We Know Drama. We created um, hit original series like The Closer, Saving Grace. We won Peabody Emmy Awards. Um, and we really created in the advertiser's mind that if you had a product that you wanted to tell a story, we were a very fertile background. I'll never forget, we, um, we had the Kleenex tearjerker theater. And under a drama brand, you can have a tearjerker. And on TBS, we saw that as a comedy brand. Um, it gave us a chance to play in syndicated comedies. It gave us a chance to bring talent like Tyler Perry to the screen and discover new voices. We brought Conan O'Brien from NBC over. And by being a comedy brand, we skewed young, and it gave us a brilliant cover to really grow reach because we had all kinds of comedies from Seinfeld to Family Guy to Tyler Perry's House of Pain, which are all comedies but none of them talk to the same audience that's where i wanted to interject because obviously as you know audit advertisers buy audiences uh, not content content drives the audience so when you are looking at drama for this one and comedy for this one were there certain demographics that you were targeting and you said i think comedy is going to appeal to these people or oh, yeah. was it more that within that you had to sort of get further nuanced to get to the right demo where advertisers would pay the well, top dollars. Well, comedy skews young. And then when you have animated comedy like Family Guy, like um, any of the Seth MacFarlane product, it skews very young. So the average age of the network was in the young 30s, which is incredibly hard to find a network that young with scale. And I, you know, I, I disagree a bit. I think content greatly matters um, in drawing audience. And I think you're seeing that now as Google and Facebook are losing advertisers by the droves because advertisers are being put in front of ISIS videos because they can't control the content. And advertisers want safe havens for their messages. And at this point in time, um, edgy fear really hadn't come in. What we were attacking was broadcast television. You know, the old saying, Willie Sutton, why did you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. Broadcast television had a 40, 50, 60% premium in commercial pricing to cable because cable was built on music videos and shopping channels. So we decided we were going to grow TBS to look like CBS from a revenue standpoint. And we did. In fact, TBS and TNT made more profit annually than NBC, Fox, and CBS combined. So you mentioned Conan which to me is, is an incredible story. I mean, here's Conan O'Brien, one of the biggest late night talk show hosts uh, in the country, if not the world. He was being heavily targeted, obviously, by all the, well, not all the major networks, but minus one of them. And you found some way to land him. How in the world do you convince Conan O'Brien at that time where maybe with, maybe Comedy Central being the one exception, late night talk show hosts don't go to cable. And yet here he is, going over to Turner. What was the pitch? Walk me through how you sold Conan O'Brien. We assumed, as everybody else did, that he was going to Fox. And I, I was reading the news clips one day, and it said that the Fox-Conan negotiations had hit a hiccup because they couldn't clear enough stations fast enough. And I thought there was an opportunity. We wanted to be in late-night television. So through a connection to his manager, we called and asked for a meeting and wanted to make a pitch. And they made a movie of Conan called Conan O'Brien Can't Stop during this period after 
the debacle with NBC. And his, his producer said to him, they were rehearsing for his tour, we need to go meet with the guy from TBS. I got a call from HBO. I had Richard Plepler, the chairman of HBO, make a call to his friend who's Jeff Ross, the producer of Conan. And um, Jeff says to Conan, we need to go visit with TBS. They want to talk to you about joining the network. Conan goes, what's wrong? Is Animal Planet booked? You know, I don't want to go. And Jeff said, you need to go. I, I promised Richard we'd go to the meeting. Um, so when I saw that after we had signed him, it made me laugh. This, this wasn't exactly a willing participant. Um, but we connected on a human level. You know, I walked in, I shook his hand. I said, Conan, 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 Conan. And he just started laughing and started relaxing. And I explained to him that instead of being a block on a schedule for a broadcast network five nights a week, he could be literally the curator of comedy at TBS and own his show and work four nights a week and be a producer and bring us programming. And I think he has two or three shows on TBS right now that he's the executive producer of. And it was a human connection. It was a chance to do something different. It was bold on our part, risky on his, but he trusted us. And Conan came from a place where he had lost trust. And we worked hard to build his trust and a little bit of the secret sauce. In, in talking to Conan and listening, he was a Civil War buff. On his honeymoon, he had driven from Atlanta to Savannah following Sherman's march to the sea from Atlanta. And understanding that President Lincoln was like a role model. And, and Harvard, you know, Conan's a Harvard-educated history major. You know, even though he was a comedy writer, he really is a huge fan of history. And so I wanted something to stop and got his attention, but also signaled to him that we were listening. So we scoured the country and we found an, eight, nine, an 1864 Civil War portrait taken by famous Civil War photographer Matthew Brady of Abraham Lincoln. And we found it in a store in Santa Monica, ironic enough because Conan lives in L.A. We had it framed and wrapped and I had it sent to his house with a note that said, let's make history together. That was it. And um, I think that was the turning point because it showed that we listened, that we understood who he was, and that we deeply wanted to do something. So we moved fast. We made a deal in nine days. And here we are, seven plus years later, Conan's still on the air every night and traveling the world and really have brought a lot of acclaim and a lot of success to TBS. Aside from the creative freedom and the flexibility and, and, and connecting on the human level, financially speaking, did you have to ante up or was he taking a big risk and taking a haircut and salary and pay and comp coming over to a cable network? Well, it was less money, but it wasn't a haircut. But we also, by having ownership, he ended up having something more valuable. He has the asset and Conan seen around the world. So from a financial basis, I think they did just fine. So if we think about the media business, the average tenure of a network president, maybe a year or two. It's that of a firefly. It's, it's that of a firefly. You were a Turner for over a decade. So how did Steve Coonan flourish in an environment when so many other people, and I would assume talented people, or they wouldn't have been at that level, so many people fail? Well, I think the, the most important thing that we did is we made television and found television and presented television that wasn't for us. It was for the, the viewer. We understood who the viewer was. You know, I never understood how you can shoot at a target if you don't know who the target is. So we really spent a lot of time doing research and understanding who the viewer is and what their hot buttons are and their motivations and what they wanted to see. And we knew that comedy was literally Prozac for young people. It was a stress relief. And it was targeted to young women after work who use comedy just as kind of levity in their day. And then we found these drama, lo drama lovers who literally wanted television that made them think and feel. And we took a bit of a consumer packaging approach 
to television, understanding, deep understanding of who the audience was, what their motivations, and then we messaged it, messaged it, messaged it, and created shows that had broad reach and appeal because back to those banks, we wanted to go take money from CBS and NBC and ABC. Kira Sedgwick on The Closer could have been on any broadcast network, won the Emmy for Best Actress, had won the Golden Globe, was five-time, you know, six-time Emmy nominee. And we made shows that could have appeared on the broadcast networks. And we treated talent like gold, so they wanted to work with us. I think one of the big breakthroughs was in 2005, we convinced Steven Spielberg to do a 16-hour uh, miniseries on our air. And it was the most recognized and um, nominated Emmy show of the year It called Into the West. And it was the real story of how the Indians move west. But having Steven Spielberg do a show for you in the early 2000s signaled to the ca talent community that something special was going on at Turner. And it allowed a lot of talent to have permission to work with us. And talent makes hit programming, not executives. So it's understanding the audience, managing talent. Um, and I also think living in Atlanta was a huge advantage because we weren't in the swirl of Hollywood. We, weren't, we didn't know about the cocktail parties. We weren't invited to the cocktail parties, and we didn't care about the cocktail parties. We did what was right for the viewer, not what was right for a um, West Coast or East Coast group of people. Let's take a step back. I mean, you mentioned earlier – you didn't come from a TV background. That was probably, in hindsight, an asset, not a liability. Absolutely. For you to think in a way that others weren't thinking, and instead of worrying about protecting your seat and protecting the power, you're, you're taking some pretty big risks that because they worked out, you go into a flourishing career, but had they not worked out, you're probably out in, in a half-life of a firefly. So you took some risks, you thought outside the box, you thought more like a, a marketer than you did as a traditional media executive. And that thinking, I think, allowed you to identify all of these areas of growth and opportunity. So it, yeah, it's I, I, I mean, I, I agree. And I was also incredibly fortunate to work with a great group of people who had diverse skills, but when you brought it all together, we worked incredibly well together. Let's move on to the Hawks. I'm assuming it's almost like a startup when you compare it to Turner. Of course, Turner is probably a startup compared uh, to Coke. What attracted you to this opportunity, this stage of your life? Well, I, I've ha I had a lot of success and a lot of symmetry. I was at Coca-Cola for exactly 14 years. I was at Turner for exactly 14 years. And I always perceived that the um, third chapter in my work career, I wanted to do something community and civic. I'm an Atlanta native. We've been in this town for 90 years. And I had been very, very, very involved in the aquarium, which wasn't about fish. It was about an economic engine to grow downtown Atlanta. And as I look out of my window of my Hawks office, I can see everything that the aquarium has spawned, other attractions, hotels, restaurants. And I think if sports is done right, it can unite and excite the citizens of a community better than anything else. And you witnessed that during the Super Bowl. We saw it when we made the Eastern Conference Finals. And so the opportunity to come into sports, which I love and have always been on the periphery of with um, at Coke, we were a huge sponsor, maybe the biggest global sponsor of sports. And at TNT, we had everything from March Madness to the NBA to Major League Baseball and, and even some golf. So I knew the industry and I just thought being able to um, – operate one of 30 sports teams, NBA teams nationally in my hometown and build it in a way that could um, excite and unite the people of Atlanta was too big an opportunity to resist. You come on board and you launch this rebranding campaign, which included new uniforms, a new logo, a newly designed court. I'm sure these are all just the tip of the iceberg though. Walk us through this branding makeover that you implemented. Well, again, followed a very similar recipe that we did at Turner that I learned at Coke. It was to understand where the opportunities are. And this is a very difficult sports town on a, because nobody's from here. If you're born in Boston, Massachusetts, and you're an NBA fan, you are a Celtics fan. There's no ambiguity. 
you move to Atlanta, Georgia, there's not a de facto makes you a Hawks fan. We have to earn it. And what we realized was the hard-boiled guy from Boston was never going to convert. And in sports, most of the target audience is middle-aged white males because the perception is that's who has the economics to afford season tickets. And the reality is there's a whole lot of other people who are underserved, who haven't been marketed to, that are attracted and love sports. And so we really shifted our focus to two areas. One is the millennial audience, the digitally savvy, experienced economy, young millennials who want to have a great night out and a great experience and who really love the NBA. And two, in the city of Atlanta, the diverse audiences. Washington Wizards have the number two um, highest amount of diverse African-American audience going to their games, about 9%. We're at 45. So we are by far the leader, and it's fantastic because it allows us to cater to an audience that wants to come to our games. It allows us to create advertising. It allows us to, to understand where the opportunity is. And Atlanta has an incredibly affluent African-American population. And so we've been able to reinvent our brand and reinvent our audience. And that audience has incredible value to marketers and advertisers because youth and diversity are growing consumers um, versus the um, general population. But, but even once you identify these, you're not a Coke. So you don't have a quarter billion dollar budget to go out and, and spread. So how do you, you've identified them. How do you actually reach out and connect with them? Social and we'll get media. To, we'll get, so, so, okay, we'll come back to social media. That's the main. Social media is the main, the main piece. Okay. So when you come into a new situation like the Hawks, it's your first week on the job. I have to imagine it's a lot easier to identify the symptoms, symptoms being low attendance, maybe sagging ticket sales, much harder to figure out the root cause. So how do you do that? Is it intuitive? Is it doing a lot of data gathering and analysis? How do you go about figuring out what that aha moment is? Well, two things. One, I was a season ticket holder for 20 years. And I had experienced a lot of things here, and they weren't all positive by any means. And, and second of all, again, very fortunate to work with great people. I brought um, my former head of research from Turner came with me day one, and one of our top marketers from Turner came with me day one. And we looked at all the research and all the data. The NBA is a very research-friendly place, and they had a lot of materials, and the team had done a lot. And it was really the interpretation. All the evidence was there. It just wasn't interpreted and built into a story and a strategy. And the story is um, something that I'm extraordinarily proud of because we took a fairly morbid franchise and made it a brand. Um, and the look of the Hawks, the voice of the Hawks, the social media voice of the Hawks. And then after the first year of doing this, and which had a lot of turmoil to it, we've got owners now who just are hard driving and understand that bringing a championship to Atlanta is keenly important. And they're making the investments in practice facilities and refurbishment of the arena in a D league team that literally are making us a first class organization. And the first class organization has a lot of appeal to the fans. At any point, did you look at other NBA owners or other sports franchise owners? So take Mark Cuban and his turnaround of the Mavericks did you look at those as case studies to draw upon or did you just start with a clean slate and ignore everything else around you? Well, we didn't ignore because we're always trying to learn and connect. I actually think Toronto is um, kind of my case study and model. They, um, they don't have a rich history of NBA in Toronto. They're located in a resurging downtown. They've been in business for about 15 years. And they've become one of the most successful franchises in all of professional sports. And they've done it through marketing. And they've done it through building a team that has great players but not superstars. And we, we've looked at Toronto a lot. But the truth is, 
Atlanta is such a unique town because it is a melting pot, pot. It is diverse. It is young. It has so many colleges and universities that there's no blueprint. So we're constantly recreating the blueprint and tearing it up and try, and amending it because um, there's not a one size fits all. You know, at Coke, sometimes one of the frustrations was, did our great marketing sell that six pack or was it because it was 99 cents? You never knew. At TNT and TBS, you got a report card every morning called ratings. Nine o'clock in the morning, you got graded for the day before. And, and while revenue and, and was key, your ratings were a very key piece. They're a huge component of revenue. Here, you've got so many different metrics. Um, 99% of people who are NBA fans around the world will never attend a game. So you consume it virtually through television, through video games, through wearing merchandise. And we've got to be great in every one of those aspects. And that's a difficult challenge. And so what I'm the most surprised here is how incredibly complex this business is. We're in 13 different business. We're probably the largest food service provider under one roof in Atlanta. We have, we wand and screen more people for security than anybody in Atlanta but the Atlanta airport. We're in the music business. We're put on 45 concerts a year with some of the biggest stars you know, in, in the world. We're in the media business. We ha- own our own radio network and we constantly are pushing out content on social media. We're in the sponsorship business, the ticketing business, the security business. Um, We just hired former police chief George Turner, head of the um, Atlanta Police Department, because as we do more and more and more things, sports becomes a target. And we have to have the very best professionals in the world protecting the safety of our players, our fans, um, and our assets. So while it is a small business relative to Coke, and to the Turner brands, it, the complexity of this business is astounding. So let's come back to social media. Under your helm, you've seen a massive increase in your presence on all the various uh, social media networks. You've landed in Google's top 10 list of most searched sports teams, uh, number one NBA team to follow on Twitter. I'm sure there's a lot more accolades. And it all happened in a relatively tight timeline. How did you do that? Can't just be about pumping out more and more content. It's not just volume. What did you do to change the way the organization thought about social media, how you approached it, and to reach those two uh, demographics in particular that you talked about? Well, it became about voice. You know, we we spent a few minutes talking about Conan O'Brien. The reason we wanted him so bad at Turner was his voice. Unique take on comedy. Conan is absurdist humor. The reason that we wanted James Duff to write The Closer is he he really understood how to write tough female characters, his voice. Our social media voice targeted to a millennial audience is very different. You know, when we grew up, the world was a lot simpler. There was much less ambiguity. The good guy wore a white hat. The bad guy wore a black hat. Our cartoons were uplifting, Bugs Bunny and, and Disney. Now, to fast forward to today's young people. Um, they saw corporations fire their parents. They saw banks go out of business. They, they see drug companies increase the cost of medicine to help people a hundredfold. And so, and their cartoons are South Park and Family Guy and Simpsons and Boondocks, which are subversive, which are, you know, which are sarcastic. They do have optimism, but it's a different voice. And if you connect to people with a voice that's not real and authentic and innovative, you don't have a prayer. So authenticity, innovation, and inclusion are really the three levers that we trip to talk to our audiences in everything we do. We've done, we just had our third um, Tinder dating night. Actually, it was such a good idea. Budweiser bought it, and it's called Let's Be Buds. And we had literally hundreds and thousands of interactions with young people in our building using Tinder. We, um, well, I want to back up. Let's talk about that one because it's one of the more fascinating campaigns, I think. What was Swipe Right Night all about? Who came up with it? 
and what was the objective and, and what happened? Let's hear. Well, the truth of the matter is I came up with it at the dinner table because I was talking about when I took the job with the Hawks, I was talking with my kids who were in their 20s. And um, I said, we're going to be very adept at social media. And they said, you don't know social media. You don't even know what Tinder is. And I said, really? We're going to do a Tinder dating night. And I got the, ew. And I brought that idea here. And I had to push very hard. People were frightened of it. This was a concern. Was your wife curious how you knew about Tinder? <laughs> she didn't know what it was, so I was fine. Um, and again, I'm very, very fortunate to work with really great people. They came up with the moniker Swipe Right Night, and we did it. And we had a lot of fun with it. And then next thing we know, it's on the Today Show and Good Morning America. What, did you, what is it? What did you do? Well, because Tinder can geo-target, we, started and we sold the ticket. Um, a special Tinder ticket. We invited young people to interact and with prompts on our scoreboard. We created a love lounge where they could leave their seat and come have drinks on us. We had roses. We had uh, boxes and crates of Altoids. And we literally put on almost a digital social where young people came together and met and connected if they really were a match, they moved to the next level, which was the fantasy suite. It was a little bit of the bachelor meets tender uh, combined with let's make it up as we go along. And actually, there's a couple that met two years ago that I think are going to get engaged rather soon. And so we really did bring people together. We excited and united, which is our North Star, um, people of Atlanta through Hawks basketball. And it, it was a theme that allowed people to literally be in the same building, 700,000 square feet, and see if they matched. And if they matched, they could meet instantly rather than setting up a future date or what have you. Um, and it was a whole lot of fun. We, um, we used the Ashley Madison data leak um, as one of our great platforms. Every year... All sports teams have to sell a flex plan, which sounds kind of boring and a little procedural, which is a 10-game season ticket. Let's call it a starter season ticket. And so the Ashley Madison data leak could come out, and what Ashley Madison as a company urged you to do was start a love affair. So we said, you know what? That's pretty tawdry, and we can't touch that unless we can twist it a bit. So we came up with the idea of um, – let's find people in Atlanta named Ashley Madison and shoot testimonials with them, how they started a love affair with the Atlanta Hawks and shh, your old team never needs to know. And we shot seven spots, including a 59 year old African American sheriff holding his driver's license to camera with the name Ashley Madison saying he's got, has a love affair going with the Atlanta Hawks. Long story short, we put it out just on YouTube and I think we had over 50 million impressions in four days and we sold thousands of flex plans. So it's talking in that voice. It's creating and, and differentiating yourself. We ain't not telling people to come down and we're going to take you out to the ball game. Maybe you can have some peanuts and cracker jacks. That ain't us. That one's already taken. Yeah. And they can have it. Sticking with social media one, one piece further, a lot of companies get very fixated on, uh, vanity metrics, the likes, the fans, the followers, uh, the retweets. So how do you measure the impact of those metrics on the business objectives? I mean, how do you know if it's moving the needle at the end of the day? Or is it more just about as long as we have a presence and people are watching us and following us, then eventually it's somehow going to turn into revenue for the business? Well, two ways. Facebook's probably become the number one ticket selling tool in sports. Um, so being on people's Facebook feed and engagement is hugely important. And the second piece is, again, I was talking about how many businesses we're in. We're in the media business. We sell our social media voice to our sponsors. And so having engaging content, and not every piece is branded and sold or sponsored, but some are. And um, it's imperative that we are authentic to our voice we don't change for a sponsor. We just won't put a sponsor on certain pieces. I would not have had a sponsor in Ashley Madison. 
you know, we did Tinder for two years before we put Budweiser on it. And so uh, engagement and all those metrics are wonderful. But most importantly, can we monetize it? And is it a real authentic communication to our fans? And so far, we've had a lot of success with both. Let's talk about brand building. You mentioned earlier the point that there's more authenticity with social media. There's a decent amount of debate around whether this authenticity, the transparency, specifically as it relates to piercing of the corporate veil, whether that's made brands obsolete. There are career-long marketers that'll say that you can't use TV anymore to quote-unquote manipulate your target audience into drinking your Kool-Aid the way you could uh, in the past. And then you've got people on the opposite end of the spectrum that say it's quite the opposite. It's that that transparency, that intimacy that actually allows companies to build even stronger brands. You've been doing this for decades. So how has building a brand changed from 10, 20, 30 years ago? Is it harder? Is it easier? What do you think? Well, I think it's much harder, but I also think you have better tools. And so I think in the early days um, with TV and just broadcast getting 30 shares for anything in every program, you talked at people, you know, and, and it was very much about function, about product attributes. And then I think it's morphed to entertainment. And sometimes, most of the time, you hear what a great commercial that was. And you go, who is it for? And they go, I don't know. You know, uh, and, and I think the Super Bowl is, you know, the absolute epitome of great advertising. I don't know who it's for. And, and I think that it's not an either or. I think a lot of these pundits like to hear themselves talk. And it's not an either or. It's literally like building a soup or a bouillon base. You better have a lot of different ingredients and a lot of different touch points. I've always believed marketing's job is to open doors in people's minds. And so there's an awareness door, there's an acceptability door, there's a desire door. I want the Hawks to be craveable, where you feel like you're missing something if you're not at a Hawks game. And it's not about awareness. We're covered. We've got multiple sports talk radio channels and TV and all kinds of things. So we don't need awareness. What we need is we need to influence people that Watching us on TV is great. Being in our building is an experience you can't duplicate anywhere else. And our players are a huge piece of our brand. And players have fans and create fans and passion. A lot of brands today don't understand that you got to make people like you and crave you. Look at what's happened with United. You know, look yes. seriously. Look what's happened, and and it's fairly predictable. First thing the CEO does is blame the other person. You know, sometimes the best thing you can do is get the facts before you speak. But the first thing you better say is, I'm accountable. I'm looking into it. And I live through this. You know, we had quite our own episode here. And transparency and communication and understanding all the facts are key. Now, I'm much smarter in hindsight than I was going through it. But today's consumer, everybody is a journalist. Everybody who has a voice on Twitter is a critic. And so you're not going to please all of the people. So you really have to have armadillo type hide and understand what the objective is. You've built some great teams over the years at all these organizations. What do you look for when you're hiring? I, I hire for chemistry. You know, we can teach you skills. But people who want to collaborate, who want to communicate, who are open to ideas, who talk about we rather than me, who don't use I, 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 but us, us, us. And so, I mean, I've made lots of hiring mistakes. It's, I think people and hiring is the single hardest thing in any job because you wouldn't marry somebody after you met them once for coffee and looked at their resume. And in a lot of ways, you're marrying the people you work with because you spend a tremendous amount of time with them. And I pride myself that both at Coke, Turner, and here, that I've tried to bring a corporate culture that people change and, and develop to rather than changing the people. 
And we've had a lot of success here. And sometimes as you need different skills, you change people because there's some people who don't have the skills as the world is changing. And this world is changing more rapidly than anybody's ever seen. And you can see that in our politics. You know, there's a dissatisfaction that created um, a political environment that's created behaviors that are new. And as a marketer, we have to adapt to those behaviors. And once you have the right people in place, what's your leadership style? I'm a huge fan of delegating. I I work for a brilliant man at Coca-Cola named Sergio Zeman. And he said... Famous marketer, sure. Very famous marketer. And he said he wanted to be the Secretary of Agriculture and farm everything out. Which was a funny line, but what he was saying was, let people do their job. Let them tend to the crops. Let them grow it. Your job is to make sure that they have all the tools they need to be successful. And... I often think of myself and my role as an environmentalist, and I don't mean the Prius driving tree hugging crap. I mean building environments for people to be successful with creative impetus, clear communication, which I struggle with. I think we're, I think that's the hardest thing is to make sure everybody knows everything in, in a concise, clear, quick manner. And just building a culture, one of our big successes of the year came from our 25-year-old head of social media. Every NBA team on August 14th at 6 o'clock puts out a schedule. And it's the usual bi-month block grid schedule. We put ours out totally in emojis. No explanation, no legend, no context. And it was only the emojis available on Apple. So the Brooklyn Nets looked like a spider web. The, you know, the Orlando Magic were a top hat. And I'll never forget, I looked... The day after we put out in the new put out our schedule, New York Knicks media capital of the world had 114 retweets and about 800 likes. In 14 minutes, we had 6,000 retweets and 12,000 likes, and it just kept growing exponentially. And two days later, we put out kind of the answers to the questions. That engagement, that idea, cost us nothing. But the best part of all of that, and it was a huge win for us, the best part of all of that was that we built a culture that a 25-year-old can take a chance with our schedule without going through approvals and bureaucracy and I don't like the way that bear looks. Well, tough luck. That's the, you know, apple bear and did it. And to me, that's the biggest testament that we're really making changes here. Well, you're one of the most entrepreneurial people I know who spent most of their career in corporate America. There are a lot of people out there that would love the benefits of having an entrepreneurial career that is a career with a lot of creative freedom, the ability to make a a real significant impact, but without all the risks and uncertainty of actually being an entrepreneur. So how did you do it? I mean, at this point, obviously, you're, you're running the show. You can do whatever you want, but you had to get to this point. Did you identify corporate cultures which incorporated a tolerance for failure, or were you generally having to go against the grain over and over and over as you were taking all of these risks along the way? Well, you know, when I ended up at Coke through a whole fluke, literally a cold call, everybody had more education than me. Everybody had more experience than me. Everybody was taller than me. I'll never forget on the elevator. It's like, holy smokes i guess i kind of stayed with that trend i worked with some pretty tall guys right now um but what they lacked was creativity and i said ideas can be my currency and what i learned was i moved from idearia you know where just ideas were flowing everywhere to connecting ideas to strategy and that's really where it comes in if you can take a white sheet of paper and turn it into an idea, there's a lot of value there, and people value it. And so I've been very blessed and fortunate to have the ability to not have fear because my job is what I do. It's not who I am, and it never has been and never will be. If I stopped working tomorrow, I'm still the same person. I just don't do the same thing. And so I've never, I've been pretty fearless about taking risks because it's just who I am. But I think ideas are the only way to drive businesses. And at Coke, my best work friend was the former CFO 
Doug Ivester, who became president and CEO. We spent a lot of time together because we were absolute opposites, but he craved and loved ideas. And he was very creative and I helped him understand the process of coming up with ideas. And Jack Stahl, who again, former CFO, brilliant guy, became president of the company. They knew ideas drove the business. So I was able to prove myself by having ideas that created tremendous value at Coke, whether it was 3D Super Bowl halftime, whether it was um, gro- developing ideas for um, McDonald's or creating the Coca-Cola Always campaign. I've used ideas as a way to um, move my career forward. And trust me, ideas are like disposable diapers. When they're full of crap, you throw, gotta throw them away. I learned real fast, I have a whole lot of diapers too. How intentional was your career path? And when I say that, I don't mean Coke and then Turner and then Hawks as if these were identified. I know there was a a bit of serendipity there. But in terms of early on saying, okay, I know I've got uh, great ideas. I know how to tie them to strategy. I think I need to go through the marketing path. I want to eventually lead a marketing organization. I want to leverage that into running a company. Was, Was any of that in the grand plan or was it literally just stumbling upon one opportunity and then the next and just doing as well as you can and seeing where, where things take you? Yeah, what you described at first, I wish I had the um, vision for. It. It, it was serendipity. I literally um, met some Coke people. I cold called them on when I was with Hiram Walker in the liquor business before, just out of school. We tried to do a promotion with Cherry Coke and haagen Cream Liqueur, which was like a Bailey's. And I met a few guys at the Coca-Cola company, and I said to myself, they really don't understand the bar and tavern segment. Um, and then I was able to, to, you know, build my confidence that I could help them grow the business, and I literally made a cold call. Um, ironic, I ran into the president of Turner, Steve Heyer, at the opening night of Phillips Arena, and they had done a reorganization. They had an opening for a head of TNT and they had a head of, opening for a head of Turner sports. And I said to him, your Turner sports job's interesting. He said, we're filling that internally. What about the TNT job? I was having dinner with a part owner of the Hawks in 2014. And he said, I need a huge favor. I said, of course, what do you need? He said, help us find a CEO for the Hawks. And I said, what about me? So time, place, opportunity, listening, taking risks. My career was never mapped out, you know. Um, Nobody's career is mapped out. It's about listening to opportunity. It's about building relationships and connections because I had known, I knew nobody at Coke. I knew people at Turner when I went there, and obviously I knew people at the Hawks when I went here. And I think it's about building a very good reputation, and I think it's about performance. But I don't think you can sit there and have a schematic um, today. I mean, I think careers are much more like bridges today than ladders. They used to be you go from A to B, B to C, and I don't think that exists today. And I think you've got to try different things. Um, I think we, as parents of a certain generation, put so much pressure on our kids that their first job matters. My first job out of the University of Georgia had a feather duster, a airplane pilot briefcase, and I went door to door to my account selling spirits, wine, beer. Um, and I'm not sure that prepared me to be CEO of professional sports team, but it taught me work ethic in it kind of just happened so knowing everything you know today from your vantage point jumping in that proverbial time machine going back decades speaking to the young 20 something steve coonan what advice do you give him enjoy the moments more when you're in the swirl and you're running stuff i'll never whenever we would have a huge rating success at turner the first thing that went into my mind was damn, I got to cycle this next year. Where am I going to find that from? We just came off a record ticket sales year here at the Hawks. And we didn't celebrate it for one second because I'm thinking of next year. And I was sitting with some friends over the weekend talking about bucket list travel. 
And they're saying this place, this place, this place. And I said, I've been there, been there, been there. And my wife goes, yeah, but you were there for a day for work. You didn't stay. And I just, I was in such a hurry to get back to be with my family because my kids were young that I went to Hong Kong for two days. I went to Sydney for three days. I went to Paris for a day. And I wish I would have slowed down because my kids didn't miss a day or two in the big picture. I wish I would celebrate more instantly. Even my first year here, we won 60 games, made the Eastern Conference Finals. And I'm not, I didn't have any fun. So I'm hoping my younger self continues to convince as we get ready for the playoffs, my older self, just enjoy the hell out of it because you never know if it's going to happen again. Great advice. Congratulations on the playoffs yet again. This has been... uh incredibly fun and insightful. Steve, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate it. Take care. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and theartofexcellence.com. I've got one small favor to ask. If you like the show, please take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'll see you next time.